Hey Kurt, Chuck here. I hope you're well. I looked at the clock and saw what time it is and realized, oh my God, I'm about to lie to Kurt twice in a row, twice in two days. <laughs> Let's pretend it's Wednesday. I'm going to stick you on a tripod in a moment. I was waiting for that. Blitzen's crying. Hang on. See, Blitzy, Daddy's got to make a movie. Now you're in here with me and you'll be happy. <laughs> I hope. Hang on. This is my pointer, Kurt. Shall 2020 sparkle? A nurse handed him out on January 1st of 2020. Passed him out to my sister and a bunch of other nurses. Then the pandemic hit. That's what caused the pandemic. That's my videography lighting, if it w as it were. I'm babbling, Kurt. I'm going to put you on the tripod. Let's get going with this. Hang on. So, boy, Kurt, this is opening a, a can of worms. I haven't thought about any of this stuff since I had the TIA, the first one anyway. And um, boy, oh boy. <laughs> I wondered, so thinking about this video, I wondered how do I even approach it, you know? How do I make a video like this? Um, and I realized maybe the best way would be to show you two examples and talk about them. This was a radio I built. I generally write the date in it. Uh, 8 of 89. Completed 8 of 89. My daughter Kelly helped me build this. She was uh, <laughs> 6 years old. And so this is a design published by Roy Lawal and W7 Echo Lima in QST Magazine, and I will, it's on my Google Drive. I'll, I'll put a link to my Google Drive uh, in the comments section. I'll pin it there. So I built this transceiver at work. Sorry about the shadow. I'm lurking behind you. I don't know how to get rid of it. I'm going to pause you and turn my overhead light off. One moment. Yeah, I'm still lurking. You can't see me, but you can't see the radio. Dang it, Bobby. <clears throat> So this is a design published by, by Roy Llewellyn. I built this at work. At least I built the local oscillator at work, most of it. And uh, I remember at the time I was able to achieve about 10 hertz drift from cold start to warm up. That was in our lab, which was fairly well temperature controlled. Um, although we had a lot of heat generating equipment in there, I had all my um, neonatal isolates in there, um, all at body temperature. Um, Bill, he had his ventilators in there. He was the ventilator technician. I was the backup one. Uh, you know, ventil a ventilator pumping out hot, humid air like you do or I do. <laughs> I've got a lot of hot air in me, I've been told. So let's take a look. Um, let's look down into this thing. Oh, I remember it had about a 10 hertz drift from cold start. But you got to remember, man, that was in 1989. <laughs> you know? And here's my first... What's this? <laughs> we must look presentable. Um, my first tip to you is that 10 hertz of drift figure comes at a cost. The cost being such ridiculously low positive feedback in the oscillator circuit um, that it can be hard to start. Why the low feedback current? Because it results in minimal heating of your oscillator transistor. Back in the day, bipolar junction transistors such as NPN type, um, they have much worse heating characteristics than an FET. But let me pause you. Let's take a look at the local oscillator box. Hang on. Okay, Kurt. <clears throat> this copper-clad um, double-sided PCB box 
contains the local oscillator. It's built on glass epoxy type FR4 board, like you see on top. That board that I just touched on top, by the way, is a driver slash PA uh, transmitter um, board. Okay. This wire right here, Kurt, I show you. This wire right here, Kurt, goes to this air variable capacitor. Let's talk about that. In an in an in a oscillator circuit, how are you going to vary the capacitance? Are you going to use a varactor diode? Or are you going to use an air variable? They both have their virtues. The varactor diode, its virtue is simplicity. Easy to obtain the diode and the uh, variable resistor, the pot. Um, what is a net, what is a drawback? Thermal stability, especially if you pass any kind of significant um, current through the diode. Um, in this case, and and Kurt, I'm only talking about analog design. <laughs> Okay, um, in this design, in this transceiver, this is a 40 meter transceiver. I'll show you the frequency counter after I'm done talking. We'll look at the, the warm up drift from a cold start. If you want to call my bedroom cold, it's about 73 degrees in here. You'll notice this wire exits the can through a hole, and uh, it's got comfortable clearance around the wire. It doesn't touch the copper clad at all. It passes through about the center of that hole. You would, you would want to keep that lead as short as possible. You would not want to use coaxial wire to make that run because change, it's, this is a critical point in your oscillator. Um, if you use a piece of coax, now you're introducing the capacitance of the center conductor to shield and along with its thermal drift characteristics. Okay, I'm going to pause you and back you out a bit. I built this transceiver about three years before I met Roy Llewellyn on the air during um, the 1992 field day contest. I was running QRPCW from the northern woods of Michigan. He was uh, near his home in Beaverton, I assume, or out in the woods. He's an avid backpacker. He's the one that designed... Uh, oh no, I'm making a video and my mind went blank. Um, <laughs> the antenna modeling software the whole world uses. <laughs> you know, Easy Nick. And Easy Nick too. <clears throat> so... What was I going to say? Oh, I built this uh, transceiver about three years before I met Roy. And um, we got to communicating. We got to be pen pals of sorts. And we'd communicate back and forth with 10 and 12 page packets of hand scribbled notes. And he started to clue me in. And, uh, whoa, whoa, oh man. Come here. He started to clue me in on some of the finer points of transceiver design, swing you to the right. And so I revisited, I lost my pointer. I revisited this oscillator in the interest of thermal stability again, and I had it optimized. And honestly, I can't remember the mix of capacitor types. Yeah, no, I lied to you. I built it three years before I met Roy, then after we had been chatting a bit, then I went, I revisited the, the oscillator, and I that's when I got the drift down to 10 hertz from a cold start, and about that per hour. It would bobble around the zero drift point and never deviate more than 10 hertz. And that's when I started learning about what we already talked about. Um, 
the level, the output level from your first oscillator transceiver, it needs to be as low as possible. You need to use as little feedback as possible to achieve reliable starts. <clears throat> Excuse me for clearing my throat. Um, that's when I started learning about that stuff. And so now I'm a little bit nervous, man, because now, uh, 1930, for 33 years later, I have no idea. I do know it turns on. I did try that before starting this video. But um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to talk about. You, you should look at, if you have any interest in the circuit, you, would, you should refer to his article because it's identical to that. Oh, I know what I was going to talk about, Kurt. What I don't remember is the type of capacitors I use, the mix of capacitors I use to achieve that drift characteristic. I'll be talking to you more about that in part two. I'm, I'm taking a break from the Aquarium ATO project for two reasons. One, I'm waiting for my Hall effect sensors to arrive. I gave up on the reed switches. Their vintage parts are not reliable. Click, 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 snap, snap. Part two will be this 30 meter transceiver, and I'll get to talk to you about capacitor types when we look at that. That is a uh, commercial uh, kit board produced by Small Wonder Labs. It started out as a 40 meter kit. Then I made it a 20 meter transceiver and then I decided to really give it a working over. I'm gonna pause you. I remade it again, this time using a uh, topology that almost was identical to the design that I showed you guys on my computer here. Um, I reworked, I reworked the local oscillator circuit, and man, did I do some experimentation with toroid types and annealing them and um, such. And look at the dust on it, Kurt. It's been sitting on my shelf. It's like, hey, Chuck, I don't know if I noticed, but solar, the solar max is about here, or around the corner. I haven't even turned it on since I had my TIA. I haven't even touched it until today to make this video. That is a superb transceiver right there, Kurt. Um, but boy, I wish this tripod wasn't so clicky. But back to this. Oh, I go the wrong way every time. So before we talk, before we look at the uh, drift, of this oscillator, Kurt, 33 years after it was last used. No, I used this in Seattle for about a year on the ground floor of my two-story apartment building. Random piece of wire, maybe 20, 18, 20 feet long, strung up around the ceiling. Another random length piece of wire connected to chassis ground running around my floor play with the wires till I could get an un <clears throat> a reasonable match, meaning 3 to 1, 4 to 1. The output PA in this transceiver is relatively forgiving, and it forgave me. <laughs> I mean, contacts all over the place with it, man. This transceiver runs about a, a watt and a quarter. <clears throat> Before we look at the frequency counter, let's talk about frequency measurement. And I also want to talk to you about expectations. I need to take a seat. One more. <laughs> Why am I talking like a dick? Hang on, man. Dear God, 14 minutes in. Have I been bullshitting again? Regarding frequency measurement, my frequency counter has been turned on for about an hour now. I'm using my vintage Heath, Heath kit. Uh, is it an IM or a IP? Can I even see it? Yeah, no. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm using my vintage Heathkit IM-4100 frequency counter with my, uh, silica scope, my, my scope probe set to times one. It's connected directly to the output of that local oscillator. I applied that local that output from the LO to that pot and I run it back through uh, RG174 coax, run it back to the driver board, and I use that for power adjustment. Because 1.25 watts is obscene, it's an obscenity of riches, and you don't need that much power when running CW. <laughs> right? So here we go, man. I coupled the scope directly to the output of the oscillator. That's a no-no. You should generally couple it through another a capacitor in series with as low a value as possible so as to result in a reading on your meter. You know, I might try 10 picofarads to start. <laughs> see if you could, uh, see if your um, frequency counter can get a stable reading at that. Um, the reason being, right now, I'm loading it, even though that scope has an input impedance that it has shunted by the very little amount of capacitance that it has, it still affects the, it has the potential of affecting the frequency stability of the oscillator. It depends on the oscillator. It depends on how well buffered the oscillator proper is before making the connection. I believe this local oscillator um, has one stage of amplification after um, the actual oscillator transistor. So that said, you should couple your scope probe as lightly as possible. You should let your frequency counter warm up if it's any kind of older um, device like mine all are. And uh, give it a go. <laughs> I'm going to turn some light back on here in the bedroom. We're almost done here, man. I'm going to turn some light back on and show you uh, the frequency counter. Hang on. Okay. I think I keep alluding to this, but I'm going to wait until part two, because this has already grown long enough, to talk to you about the various types of um, oscillator tune circuit capacitors you might use so as to cancel out drift. We'll be talking about the inductor as well, and we'll save all of that for part two. Oh, I'm winded. Okay. Um, the transceiver's off. It's been off. I, I turned it on to see that I had a signal, and I did, so I switched it back off. That was about an hour ago. Okay. I've got it set. The mode is frequency. Um, the gate is set to read out in megahertz. And uh, when I switch, we'll look and see, okay? After I turn the transceiver on, I'm going to reach up with my left hand and switch this frequency counter to kilohertz um, to get better resolution. We can, get, we can read down to the hertz that way, but we lose the most significant digit. We'll lose the seven, I believe. Watch it make a liar out of me. I've only used this, I think, twice. <laughs> it's a toy, all right? <laughs> so, reach down. And after we after we watch the fre frequency drift, and I'm sure it'll be significant. It, it's a long, it, it's been sitting on the shelf for over 30 years. Um, I keep, my mind keeps going blank. After we do, I'm going to pause you. i got to gather my thought. Hang on. It keeps leaving me. Hang on. Okay. I got it back. When I turn the radio on, then I reach up and switch the frequency counter to the kilohertz range. I'm going to talk to you about expectations, Kurt. What exactly are your expectations? What are you using this analog oscillator in? What's good enough, 
regarding drift, short-term, long-term? I don't like those two terms. What is short-term? Seconds? A minute or two? Does turn on from cold start count toward short-term drift? Better not. <clears throat> it takes a very, very advanced digital oscillator to have no drift from cold start. I don't think there is such a thing, honestly. So what are your expectations? What are you using it in, Kurt? What's good enough? Short-term, long-term? What is long-term? Well, I'd say over an hour. What's short-term? Mm, give, it, give it five minutes to warm up. Then start your short-term test. What's short-term? Mm, drift, drift over the course of a minute to two or three. Why would that be different than long-term? Oh, man, it can bobble up and down all around. And then halfway through its long-term warm-up, take a dive and then recover from it and end up a few hertz from where it started. If you have the equipment, you could plot the, the frequency. Else, you could look up and jot it down every five minutes. Plot it yourself. What are your expectations? What's good enough? Are you using the oscillator for a uh, ham radio, QRP, transceiver, or receiver, or transmitter, CW, or phone? Because what you need is radically different between the two. How long does a CWQ so last? <laughs> you know... Uh, it's not a problem to reach up and touch the rit control as you drift. <laughs> you know? As your radio drifts, what's the best practice? Should you keep touching it up or should you let it go? <laughs> That's a subject for another talk. Okay, I'm babbling because I'm nervous. Let's go. Let's give it a go. Radio going on now. That's what it was when I tested it an hour ago. After we watched the drift, here we go. I'm gonna It did say seven dot what did it say? Seven dot four four megahertz. Come on, Chuck. Oh god, that switch. 7144 it's 7143.08 <laughs> so your your the the least the LSD the least significant digit is going down you're able to read it to the hertz this is power on drift on a radio that hasn't been powered up for 33 years a homebrew radio. Look at the frequency, Kurt. 7143.074. You think we've reached short-term stability? You think we've reached... Not, I sh forget I said that. You think we've reached power on stability? I'd say so. Look at it, man. <sighs> Forgive me while I stand here and gloat. Excuse me while I kiss the sky? Yeah, I know. Excuse me while I stand and gloat. Boom. There you go, Kurt. There's your supper. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, <laughs> as Terrell likes to say, Terrell Dactyl. You ever watch Terrell? Oh, man. Over the top. So, I was going to talk to you about something while we looked at it, watched it drift. Um, I guess about what we were just talking about. What do you need out of your oscillator? This was a CW rig. It's now drifting less, less than two or three. It's bobbling around uh, up and down a couple hertz. 
Is that good enough for you? I'm being a damn asshole. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's what you can accomplish by canceling out drift with the proper choice of capacitors and by annealing your inductor choke. We'll talk about inductor choke types, inductor types when we look at the other transceiver in the next episode. Now see, it might hang right there, Kurt, for the longest time, for a half hour. And then all of a sudden, you drop 30 hertz or go up 30 hertz and then stay there. You know? Um, whoa, my timer says eight minutes. Oh, I hope that first part got recorded. Anyway, switch us back to the megahertz range. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. Let's look at the range of this uh, oscillator. If I lay my hand on it, you think it'll change? If I put my hand over it, you think it'll change? Better will. Let's see how much I grabbed the knob just now. And now uh, Chucky did good. That's the highest frequency. See, this transceiver is designed to cover from basically 7.0 to 7150. You can catch 20 kilohertz of single sideband action. It <laughs> works good, too. I should demo this rig on on a you on a video. So now we're going the other way. We're going we're <coughs> we are we're increasing capacitance which drops the frequency. Let's see if how low it goes. It probably needs to be calibrated. There's a there's a trimmer cap to set the low end. I wanted it to go I want it to go down to seven dot oh oh oh. No. Looks like that's about the uh, lowest I can go, which isn't bad. Um, dang, man. Five kilohertz off after 33 years, and it's just the turn of a pot. I'm going to pause you and see if I can <laughs> quickly find the pot. Hang on. God, well, God, I'm stupid. I'm an idiot, Kurt. The pot's inside the metal box. <laughs> Yeah, usually I'll uh, drill a hole. Oh, I did. Yeah. Yeah, I got it glowed again. Let me show you something, man. Hang on. <laughs> Not the glowed again. But yeah, best practice if you're going to mount a board on top of your local oscillator can, A, drill a hole for uh, trim pod access, or trimmer cap access in the, in the shield itself. And then in any boards that you may mount on top of it. That's the calibration point. Well, that's all I got for part one, Kurt. In part two, we'll look at a, a nice, a, a super hat transceiver. This is direct conversion. Didn't show you the receiver board. That's the receiver board, Kurt. It's got hand wound uh, diode ring mixer. You see it? Can you see it? Where's the mixer, Kurt? <laughs> what an idiot. Bitsy says, I love you. I'll talk to you later. Look at that. That's a shame. I hope you're well, Kurt. I hope I get this posted before it's Friday. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Oh, wait. I forgot my classic. My classic. For part two. Hey, Kurt. We'll use the frequency counter with Nixie tubes. I'll talk to you later. Bye.